Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another installment of Chapter 10, The Muscle Chapter. This is the longest chapter we've had so far. Um, it will not be the longest chapter yet because I think NERVS is a pretty long segment as well. Um, today, what we're going to do is that we're going to talk about energy muscles for energy for muscle contraction. So we'll talk about the role of ATP and glycolysis, and we'll also talk about about fermentation, so we'll talk about exactly where does that ATP come from that's needed to recock the myosin head. So this session will only cover just that portion of it. We won't go any further than that. And then our very last discussion on this will happen on Thursday, and that will be comparing cardiac and smooth muscle. So remember, we don't talk a whole lot about cardiac and smooth muscle because we're going to just save that for AMP2, but we will hit on it a little bit and talk about the shape of those muscle cells and exactly how they contract, but it'll be um, a very short portion of this. Um, a little bit of FYI, um, as we go further, um, make sure that you are viewing these lectures, um, if you're viewing the recordings of them, because the muscle notes are, they can get very, very dense. And it'll be difficult, and I don't recommend watching four or five different lectures in a, all in a row at one time, because it can be a little daunting. Um, but be sure that you're watching them and you're keeping up with, with our notes. All right. So where we last left off is that we were talking about what happens for a muscle contraction from the neuromuscular junction on down to the myofibril, the active and myosin filaments interacting with one another. And we've established that acetylcholine is released from the presynaptic cell via the synaptic terminal. And what allows acetylcholine to be released is the influx of calcium ions into the synaptic cleft. When those calcium ions are released, they float across the synaptic cleft, and they will bind to the receptors on the motor end plate of the muscles that will allow for sodium ions to come in. Those positively charged sodium ions are going to take us from resting potential, negative 70 millivolts, and generate an action potential. When that action potential is generated, that's going to be felt or reverberate all throughout the entire muscle cell or muscle fiber. As that happens, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will release the calcium that's been stored in the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. How that calcium gets out is that it will leave out through those T-tubules. When it leaves through the T-tubules and it is triggered to leave out because of the action potential that came from the sodium ions coming into the cell, when um, that calcium leaves out, calcium binds to troponin, causes tropomyosin to roll off of the active site of the S actin G actin G protein. Myosin heads will bind to those active sites, pull the thin filaments in towards the center. ATP will then be used. It's hydro hydrolyzed, which means that it breaks down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. When that hydrolyzation takes place, it recocks the myosin head. In the synaptic cleft, any of that leftover acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. So now what we're going to talk about today is exactly how do we get this ATP? Because apparently ATP is pretty important to make sure that we can get more muscle contractions. If we don't have any ATP available, as we discussed with rigor mortis, then that means we're going to have this sustained contraction because we won't have any um, energy to recock that myosin head. In general, muscles are going to store enough energy to start a contraction. Anything after that, that means the muscle fibers or the muscle cells are going to have to make more ATP as needed. Now, the way that we reserve ATP is that we have two different molecules that we can use as our reserves. So remember we said that it takes that the muscle cell is going to store just enough energy or ATP to get the contraction started. Anything else, we're going to have to manufacture it as we go along. ATP, obviously, is the way that we store energy. ATP is the energetic or energy currency of the cell. And then we also have this molecule, creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate can can hold on to, the creatine molecule can hold on to excess phosphate groups. So when we need to phosphorylate or put another phosphate group onto ADP, adenosine diphosphate, then we have this creatine that's available to allow that to happen. So the energy recharges ADP to ATP. So ATP, that's just that stored energy. Creatine phosphate, we consider it a reserve because we can use the phosphate onto creatine phosphate to turn ADP, which is adenosine, to phosphate, diphosphate, into adenosine, take the phosphate from creatine phosphate. So now we've gone from two phosphates to three phosphates, which makes it ATP. The way that that has to take place is that we have to use that enzyme called creatine phosphatase. 
phosphyl kinase. So creatine phosphyl kinase will literally take off the phosphate group from creatine and put it on to an ADP molecule. You're probably asking, well, where do all those ADP molecules come from? Remember when we recocked that myosin head and the ATP was hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate? Well, we have that inorganic phosphate and that ADP kind of just floating around. So when we want to turn that ADP into more ATP, well, we have this storage or reserve molecule, creatine phosphate, that will attach onto the ADP and turn it into ATP. When we use up all of our creatine phosphate, um, our creatine phosphokinase, then we have to use other mechanisms to generate ATP. And these other mechanisms by which we can generate energy um, Aerobic respiration and fermentation are concepts I'm sure you're probably pretty familiar with because you've talked about them pretty much your entire biological career, from an introductory class to even a ninth grade biology class. You talk about how do we manufacture more energy. But remember that the creatine phosphate, along with the enzyme creatine phosphokinase, is one of the reserve mechanisms that we use to generate ATP um, very quickly. It's kind of our, our backup, our reserve, that's the amount of energy that's required to get that contraction started. So the two ways that ATP can be produced outside of the reserves that we talked about is aerobic metabolism and anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis can be used interchangeably with the term fermentation, and we just call it lactic acid fermentation. Um, anaerobic means not with oxygen, so without oxygen. Aerobic means with oxygen. Aerobic metabolism is the most efficient way to get energy. Using oxygen to pull or drive the electron transport chain is the most efficient way to get energy for any cell, specifically for a muscle cell. However, in order for aerobic metabolism to take place, it has to have oxygen, and it's going to take place in the mitochondria. For anaerobic glycolysis, it doesn't take place in the mitochondria. It happens in the cytoplasm of the cell or the sarcoplasm of a muscle cell. And since it says ana, an always means not of, it doesn't require oxygen. Although it doesn't require oxygen, you're still able to get energy. So for aerobic metabolism, big take-home messages here. And let's grab some sunburst. Um, it's a primary energy source of resting muscle cells. So when a muscle is not active, when it is at rest, we generate energy um, through aerobic metabolism because you're resting, you're getting sufficient oxygen to those muscle cells. The, the muscles aren't oxygen deprived or facing any oxygen dead. So this is how your muscle cells are able to generate energy. Aerobic metabolism can not only break down carbohydrates, but it can also break down fatty acids. When you talked about aerobic metabolism in an introductory biology course or in a ninth grade biology course, you we probably talked about carbohydrate um, breakdown, um, where we took glucose and we went through glycolysis and broke it down into um, those two pyruvate molecules and so forth. Um, keep in mind that aerobic metabolism can still use carbohydrates as the main fuel source or still use glucose, but in aerobic metabolism we can also use fatty acids. So when you think about a triglyceride or a dietary fat that has a glycerol head and three fatty acid tails, well it can break down that triglyceride molecule. We're going to get about 34 ATP molecules for every glucose molecule we break down. Now keep in mind that this number is a bit of an estimate because in some textbooks you might have 34, some you might have 32, some you might have 36, and it kind of just depends on what our starting material is, if we're using fatty acids or if we're using glucose or we're using proteins, and it also depends on what kind of cell this process is happening in. So for your exams, I will ask you um, for a range. So somewhere between 34 and 38 ATP. So I'll ask you for that range as opposed to just one set number because that number is not really carved in stone for aerobic metabolism. When we look at anaerobic glycolysis, or another way that we can say that is fermentation, this is the energy source that our muscles use when we're at peak muscular activity. So when you're actively running, when you're actively biking, when you're actively climbing your mountain, or whatever this energetically expensive activity that is just you're doing. From this process, notice we only get two ATP molecules per glucose. 
So clearly, this is not the most efficient means by which to get energy. However, you're able to get it a lot faster than with aerobic metabolism. So we are going to break down glucose that's been stored um, in various different places. Glu glucose, which has been stored in the form of glycogen in your skeletal muscle cells and also in your liver. So since we have a nice ready supplied store of glucose in the muscle cells and also in the liver, anaerobic glycolysis is going to give you energy a little bit faster. It won't give you as much energy, but it will give you energy a little bit faster without having oxygen. So any of these cells that you're working that are kind of oxygen deprived, um, they're not able to get oxygen to them fast enough for a road metabolism to take place, you have kind of an emergency um, mechanism, and that's your anaerobic glycolysis. And not only does it not require any oxygen, so you don't have to wait for oxygen to be delivered by your red blood cells, but you also have the energy source that's required already in the muscle cell itself. So at peak exertion, your muscles lack the oxygen to fully support the activities that happen in the mitochondria. For anaerobic, or I'm sorry, for aerobic metabolism, that happens in the mitochondria, as we said in the very beginning of these notes here. So sometimes we can't get, when we're having a lot of exertion at our peak exertion, we're not able to get enough oxygen to all of the muscle cells, to their mitochondria, in order to facilitate aerobic metabolism. So in that case, the muscles are going to have to rely on a process that doesn't require any oxygen, glycolysis. Now, every time we have glycolysis take place, that glucose molecule is broken down into two, three carbon molecules that we call pyruvate. So that pyruvic acid is going to be then converted to lactic acid. And that lactic acid will build up eventually um, if we don't get rid of it through the Cori cycle. So another drawback to um, aerobic resp anaerobic respiration or anaerobic glycolysis is that we have this buildup of lactic acid. Lactic acid, we can take care of it and it can be converted back into um, the starting material, we can have some conversion happen of lactic acid, and that process takes place in what's called the Cori cycle of the liver. However, if we have too much lactic acid build up too quickly, then we can't get rid of it all at one time. And the muscles will actually give out um, if you have too much lactic acid build up very quickly. We've all had lactic acid build up. That burn you feel with exercising, that is your lactic acid build up. So what we're looking at here is that we have uh, three different muscle cells, one at resting, one at peak activity, and one at moderate activity. And then we're going to look at how we generate um, energy at when the muscle cell is undergoing each one of these or having each one of these experiences. So for a resting muscle cell, we can take fatty acids or we can also take glucose that's just in the bloodstream um, and we can get energy out of it. So the fatty acids can be broken down um, through the process of glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. All of those are the three elements of aerobic metabolism. Um, we're going to release some carbon dioxide off into the atmosphere. Big take home that we get from this is that we're going to get energy or ATP. This ATP, um, we can have a couple of things that happen to it that we can just use it and keep it as a storage molecule for the uh, muscle contraction, or we can have um, creatine bind with a phosphate and also have another storage of creatine phosphate, which we talked about in the very first slide, that creatine phosphate along the enzyme creatine phosphokinase can turn ADP into ATP. When we are at rest here, that glucose that we got in our bloodstream, we're going to take that glucose and we are going to um, what's called glycogenesis, and we're going to turn it into a glycogen molecule. And that glycogen molecule just stays as a storage for when we need a quick source of energy. When we are at our moderate activity, fatty acids will still be converted into ATP. You'll still get some energy for that. Um, you'll still release carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Anytime we have um, aerobic metabolism, we're going to have this byproduct of carbon dioxide, which goes into your bloodstream, binds to your red blood cells, um, and you exhale out, goes to your lungs, and you exhale it out. Notice that for both moderate activity and for resting muscle cells that we use oxygen, and that oxygen goes directly to 
the mitochondria. And then what comes out, the gas that comes out, is CO2. So very important to note that for aerobic metabolism, it requires the use of oxygen. Oxygen is a final electron acceptor in aerobic metabolism, and it's going to always, in eukaryotic cells, be used in the mitochondria. Now notice here that when we're at our moderate activity, instead of glucose coming out of the bloodstream and being stored as glycogen, we have some of that glycogen being broken down into glucose, and it also is going through um, aerobic metabolism. So we see that glucose gets broken down into pyruvic acid, and that pyruvic acid goes into the, the mitochondria in order to give us ATP. So in moderate activity, both glucose and fatty acids are broken down, and we use that ATP to power the contractions that are required to keep you going through your event, your, your exercise. Now, at peak activity, notice what happens here. There's no oxygen that's available. We're not thinking about those fatty acids. What we have here is all internal. It's all in-house. We don't have time to wait for fatty acids and oxygen to be delivered by the blood vessels. We're going to have to use what's available. Glycogen will be broken down into glucose, which is then further broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. Through that process, we get two ATP molecules. In addition, creatine phosphate, along with its enzyme creatine phosphokinase, will phosphorylate or put a phosphate group onto ADP and make ATP. So both of these processes where we'll have glycogen gets converted into pyruvic acid, gives us energy, creatine phosphate, phosphorylates or gives a phosphate group to ADP, turns it into ATP that gives us energy. So both of these mechanisms are ways that we're able to get energy. But notice what we have here. That lactic acid, that pyruvic has been converted to after the whole process of fermentation, um, that byproduct is then going to go into the bloodstream and be taken care of through the core cycle. So most of our ATP that we get from in peak activity is going to be generated through glycolysis, but we're going to have this lactic acid buildup. The activity in the mitochondria um, is not really happening here because we don't have enough oxygen that's getting to this place. So that's why we don't really show the mitochondria. Going back to our tour of the muscle cell, in the very, very first series of lectures that we did here, the first of our series, um, we noticed that skeletal muscle cells have many, many, many mitochondria. Now that we understand the whole purpose of mitochondria, it kind of makes sense that we have lots of mitochondria because using oxygen in the mitochondria is the most efficient way to get energy. So our recovery period is the amount of time after full exertion for our muscles to return to normal. At this point, so we're no longer at our peak activity, at this point oxygen becomes available, and as that oxygen becomes available, mitochondrial activity can resume. The Cori cycle is a process of removing and recycling lactic acid by the liver. The liver is going to convert that lactic acid into pyruvic acid, and then that pyruvic acid can then be um, converted again into that starting material. So the glucose is released to recharge the muscle glycogen reserve. So through this Cori cycle, what we broke down, we're able to rebuild it again and send it back to the skeletal muscle cells in order for us to use it in the form of glycogen to get broken down if we have a need for that immediate sugar. The oxygen bed is what happens after exercise or in other exertion. And at this point here, and you guys have all ex uh, experienced oxygen bed, where you're out for a run, you're out for a bike or whatever it may be, and then you start to breathe more heavily, that's because you need to regain all of that. You need more oxygen than normal to kind of normalize your metabolic activity. So um, after heavy exercise or some other exertion, it results in heavy breathing. You need more oxygen to try to get back to normal. So um, all of this on this slide we've already talked about and we saw it in the picture, but just to repeat it again to make sure that we're all on the same page, skeletal muscles at rest will break down fatty acids to get energy, and then they will store the glucose in the form of glycogen. When you have moderate or light activities, your muscles can make ATP through both aerobic metabolism, where we have the fatty acids get broken down um, in the mitochondria or through the process of the, the glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, most of which two of those three steps happen in the mitochondria. And then we also have the conversion of glycogen into glucose, and then that can go through those three steps of cellular respiration or aerobic metabolism.
um, to get energy out of it. So notice that we can use carbohydrates, lipids, or amino acids, any of those um, uh, molecules, those macromolecules that are required for, for life, for living those four classes of organic molecules, we can get energy out of them. At peak activity, the only way that we're able to get energy, because there's not enough oxygen that's readily available, is through anaerobic reactions, which we call anaerobic glycolysis. And one of the drawbacks of glycolysis, even though we have immediate source of uh, sugar, because glycogen is broken down into glucose, glucose, it's right there in-house, it's very speedy and quick. The big problem with that is lactic acid buildup. Um, not so much of an issue if we only build up enough that can be dealt with through the quarry cycle by the liver. If we have too much of it that's generated too quickly and the liver can't process it all in a timely fashion, and remember the processing done by the liver is to turn the lactic acid back into pyruvate, to turn it back into glucose to be stored as glycogen. Um, if that process in the quarry cycle can't happen very quickly, the muscle will literally shut down as a result of lactic acid buildup and you won't have any contractions for a while. And sometimes you'll see marathon runners at the very end of a race, um, they have too much lactic acid buildup, they will literally collapse. Heat reduction and loss, active muscles gener generate heat, which we understand about 70% of um, muscle energy can be lost as heat and that will raise your body temperature, just another reason why you're, um, when you're exercising you will get hot, you'll get warmer because your muscles are generating a lot more heat. Um, other things that can affect your muscle metabolism are growth hormone, the availability of it, testosterone, the availability of that can also affect your muscle metabolism um, and also your hormones. Generally, if you have testosterone, you have a slightly higher metabolic rate than if you don't have this um, particular hormone. Thyroid hormones, um, if you have hypothyroidism, those people typically have slower metabolism because um, these thyroid hormones are responsible for the conversion of um, a lot of these events that take place in the skeletal muscle cells, so hypothyroidism, you're not making as many of those T3 and T4 hormones, all of which we'll talk about in the endocrine system pretty soon here. Um, so as a result, um, your metabolism is a little bit slower. Hyperthyroidism, it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. And then epinephrine, which can, both, can be classified as both a neurotransmitter as well as um, a, a hormone here. That epinephrine is an excitatory neurotransmitter type thing, so it can speed up metabolism. And usually epinephrine doesn't, it doesn't have very long lasting effects, they're usually short lived. So now on to um, muscle power and muscle performance. Um, power is the maximum amount of tension that's produced. Endurance is how, how long you can do this activity. Power and endurance are going to directly be related to which mechanism is the best, either anaerobic glycolysis or with metabolism to gain energy. So this is how they connect with one another. Power and endurance is going to not only determine which type of metabolism you'll use to get the energy for this activity, um, but it also depends on the type of muscle fibers, whether they're slow twitch or fast twitch fibers, and it also depends on physical conditioning. Typically, muscles that are built for power are going to be very big, so they're very large cells, those muscles that will generate a lot of power. Endurance muscles, they tend to have a um, longer, leaner appearance to them. So the way that I like to kind of compare them is that if you think about different types of runners, people that are marathon or distance runners, what do their bodies usually look like? They're usually really long, kind of lean sorts of muscles. Whereas someone who's a sprinter that runs like the 100, the 200, what do their thigh muscles look like? They look like tree trunks, so they have these huge thigh muscles because they're not really built for, for endurance, they're built for power, maximum power in a very short amount of time there. Now that doesn't mean that um, muscles can't change, so physical conditioning can change endurance type muscles and make them better suited for power, and the same thing for power type muscles to make them better suited for endurance. Myself as an example. My thighs are huge. That's just kind of how I came here. I remember my dad said when I was born, the nurses commented on how thick my thighs and buttocks were. I'm built for power. So I have a lot of um, very large muscles. It's just how I'm just genetically built there. 
in high school, I ran a lot of the sprints that were mostly my races. And then in college, I kind of switched over and did more distance type of running. So it took a little bit more physical training and conditioning, but um, my muscles were able to sustain a amount of activity for a longer period of time so that it can change. So it's not that just because you're built for power doesn't mean that you can't do anything else. It's just going to require some physical conditioning. But it's easier for me to train for um, short races than it is for long races because that's kind of genetically how I'm built. So the three different types of muscle fibers that we'll talk about are fast fibers, slow fibers, and intermediate fibers. As you can imagine, intermediate fibers means that their twitch or their rate of contraction is going to be between that of fast fibers and for slow fibers. So for our fast fibers here, things to remember about them is that, as the name suggests, they contract quickly. They contract very fast. They have a very large diameter, lots of glycogen reserves, um, and very few mitochondria in there. So let's just stop real quick and let's go back to where we talked about those two modes of gaining energy. Which one of these modes of gaining energy does it seem like this fits best with these fast fibers? Very few mitochondria, large glycogen reserves. Well, you're probably thinking this looks like anaerobic glycolysis would work very well for this. And you're absolutely right, because we need energy very quickly. When you're running the 100 meter dash, 200 meter dash, or even the 400, that's a fast race. That um, really good times for 100 meter are like 12 seconds, and the race is over. You know, for the 200 meter, um, you're talking really good times, 28 seconds, and the race is over. So we need to be able to have energy very quickly. We want to generate ATP as quickly as possible. And the quickest way between aerobic metabolism and uh, anaerobic glycolysis to get energy was anaerobic glycolysis. So since we have all of this glycogen that's already stored up in there, and these fibers don't have a whole lot of mitochondria, it only makes sense that we generate energy very quickly. Fast fibers will also have very strong contractions. Now, they have very strong contractions. They're built for power. However, they're also going to fatigue very quickly as well. So they, they, they'll they fatigue on, on that side. They're not going to give you endurance as you would with the slow fibers. Slow fibers are much slower to contract, but they're also slower to fatigue. Slow fibers are built for endurance. Um, my husband is more of a longer, leaner kind of muscle, and he was always a distance runner. He ran cross country in high school, and even now he'll just decide to get out and go run four or five miles just as a stress reliever. So, and running's not um, anything that's difficult for him to do. His body is built for endurance. So slow fibers are slow to contract, but they're also slow to fatigue. They have a much smaller diameter, so they're not nearly as big as those fast fibers that we just talked about, but they have more mitochondria. Since they have more mitochondria and they have a high oxygen supply of the two methods of generating ATP, which of these two do you think fits best with slow fibers, anaerobic glycolysis or aerobic metabolism? Aerobic metabolism, absolutely. So slow fibers are going to generate their energy using aerobic metabolism much more than you would see for the fast fibers. Because we need energy for the long haul, right? We don't need just, you know, very quick energy and then it's all over with. We need energy that's going to sustain us for some time. Also, what we find in slow fibers is that they have a, a pigment, a respiratory pigment. It's kind of like a respiratory pigment that's called myoglobin. And what myoglobin will do is it has a high affinity or an attraction for oxygen. So that's why they have such a high oxygen supply, because they have this pigment, um, this molecule, this protein that's called myoglobulin, and it will hold on to the oxygen so that they can slowly release oxygen in the muscle cell as it's needed while you're going on your seven or eight mile run in order to facilitate the energetic demands of those fibers. Now, with intermediate fibers are mid-size. They do have some myoglobin, but it's a very low amount of myoglobin, not nearly as much as they're in slow fibers. Um, fewer capillaries than fast fibers, and they're also a little slower to fatigue. The myoglobin that's found in the slow fibers, it causes the muscles to appear dark. So it kind of has a dark appearance to them. And for the um, fast fibers, since they don't have that, then they have more of a whitish appearance to them. <coughs> 
So here we have that. We have our fast fibers. They're more lighter in color, larger diameter, um, easily fatigue. Your slow fibers here, they're darker in color. They're darker because of the myoglobin. And they're less fatigue resistant. Now, that doesn't mean because you've got a bunch of these slow fibers that you're going to be able to run indefinitely. Um, they are going to have some point where you're going to have to refuel and get some food in there and all that good stuff. But they are more fatigue resistant than the fast fibers. Now, when you think about so the slow fibers are kind of be like your dark meat, and then the fast fibers would kind of be like your white meat. So white muscle are mostly fast fibers. Good example when you talk about animals is chicken breast. So chicken breasts are mostly consisted of um, fast fibers. And that makes sense. Two fly is an energetically expensive activity. And in order to get those powerful contractions to take place or to, to generate flight, you want to have some muscles that can generate energy very quickly. Chicken, for the most part, are flightless birds. They can do a little bit of flying, but not a whole lot. And if you've ever watched a chicken fly, um, it's not really going too far. So those muscles will fatigue very quickly. So they don't fly for very long um, because they kind of fatigue. They're, milk, they're, they're built more for power and not so much for endurance. Whereas if you have something like an eagle, then their uh, breast will probably be consisted of more of the, the red muscle. So for red muscle, those are mostly slow fibers. So and we can kind of think about that as sort of the dark meat of the chicken. Chickens don't fly a whole lot. What do they do? They walk around. So they walk around all day. They should have muscle fibers that are built for that endurance to walk around all the time. Now let's go back to our eagle. Since the eagles are able to fly for a longer distance, then it probably stands to follow that their breast is made mostly of red muscles, something that's built for um, endurance. And then their legs, since they probably don't spend as much time walking around as a chicken, it's probably consisted more of um, white fibers. For human muscle cells, um, most of our muscle cells are going to be pink or our fibers, or I should say um, the muscle itself looks pink because it's mixed. It has your fast fibers and your slow fibers kind of all mixed in there. What we consider mu muscle hypertrophy um, is the muscle growth happening from heavy training or exercise. It will increase the diameter of your muscle fibers. It increases the number of myofibrils, which remember are actin and myosin filaments. They make up the sarcomere, which is the contractile unit of muscle. It increases the number of mitochondria you have. It increases your gly glycogen reserves. So all the stuff that you need for a nice, efficient contraction to take place is muscle hy hypertrophy. You'll notice that if you start a workout regimen at first, you feel like you're going to die. You feel so tired. You're so exhausted. But then later on, as you do it more, as you're more consistent, as you build up more muscle, then you find that you actually will feel better and you will have more energy. You have more energy because you have more mitochondria, more glycogen reserves, more of the units that are responsible for making the contraction take place size of the muscle fiber has gotten larger. So you've done all of these things to build up the muscle. On the other hand, and we have muscle atrophy. This is from a lack of muscle activity. So all of the things that were happening in muscle hypertrophy are now going to go in the opposite direction. Muscle size is going to be reduced. Your tone is going to be reduced, as well as your power is going to be reduced. I believe I read an article not too long ago that muscle Atrophy takes place sometimes in as short as three days. Now, you're not going to get a whole lot of muscle atrophy, but in the shortest three days, if you don't regain, um, ret re retain your exercise schedule, then you can start to lose some of the gains, if you will, that you've made um, from your exercise routine. So that's why it's always a good idea to exercise while you're on vacation. Um, even if it's if you're on a four-day vacation, even if it's just once out of those four days, um, it helps to make sure you don't lose. Um, any of your muscle tone, size, or power. And you've probably all experienced that. When you work out, and then you go on vacation, and then you don't work out for four or five days, it feels like you're starting over again. Because in essence, you kind of are. Physical conditioning not only improves your power, but it also improves your endurance. If you want to improve your anaerobic activities or the um, activities of your white fibers, then you want to do very short um, 
quick, strenuous workouts, so like 50 meter dash, weightlifting, 100 meter run, um, those will all be good anaerobic activities, something that's going to generate power very quickly, but then those muscles get a chance to rest. Usually sprinter workouts are going to be shorter and more intense than the distance runners. Distant runners are going to have um, longer workouts, but they're not going to be nearly as intense as for the sprinter workouts are, because remember, we're trying to build up this power, not so much the endurance. Um, we can improve um, this for power by having frequent, um, brief, intensive workouts, and this is going to give you a lot of muscle um, hypertrophy. Um, aerobic activity is supported by the mitochondria, requires lots of oxygen and nutrients. What helps to improve aerobic um, activities are repetitive training. Um, so going on this run or going on this bike ride or whatever it is, um, more frequent um, and doing it, you know, kind of a repetitive training, the same runs or same distance um, somewhere in there over and over again. And also it, it improves your cardiovascular health as well. And remember, as we talked about atrophy and muscular hypertrophy, what you don't use, you lose. Um, your muscle tone indicates your base activity in the motor units of your muscle, and the more tone you have, the more calories you're going to burn. So not only do those toned muscles look good, but they're also good for you. Um, when a muscle is not used for days or weeks, it becomes flaccid. And in that process, the muscle fibers can break down the proteins and actually become smaller and weaker. So if you have prolonged inactivity, um, and we see this a lot for people that um, may be bound to a wheelchair or if you have a cast on for an extended period of time, sometimes you can see fibrous tissue replacing some of this muscle tissue on there. Now, if you've lost some muscle tone or you've lost um, some power, that doesn't mean that you'll never get it back, you just have to kind of build back towards it. Because remember we talked about those myosatellite cells, and they're right there underneath the endomycin, and the job of the myosatellite satellite cells was to prepare muscle cells. So as your body starts to notice that you are and they're engaging in more um, activities, it will repair those uh, muscle fibers or muscle cells and will also build additional ones because you do have a stem cell, that myosatellite cell, um, that's available to do that. So even if we lose it, we can always regain it back. That's a good part of the story. All right, so this is where we're going to end for today because I know we've had some really long um, lectures here in the muscle chapter, and I really want you to focus on a lot of the stuff that we did in the beginning um, and also get a good understanding of what we're doing now. So that's where we're going to end our discussion for today. And then on Thursday, we will wrap up with a discussion of cardiac and smooth muscle, and that will be the very end of the chapter. All right, questions, comments, or concerns? If not, then I will see you all in a couple of hours in lab for some of you guys. Some of you guys I'll see you on another day in lab. But have a great morning and a good afternoon. Talk to you later.